Okay, we are recording. So uh, if you want to learn more about what I've been showing you prior to the presentation, my blog is mycuffrobbins.com. An easy way to get there is my initials are MR like Mr. So you can go to mrpowershell.com and that's an alias. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about build, building unconventional SQL Server tools in PowerShell. And uh, I speak at a lot of SQL Saturday events. So, uh, and I've actually been working with SQL Server longer than PowerShell, and I've been using PowerShell since version 1.0. But I started with SQL Server in the 6.5 days. Also, notice at the bottom of this uh, slide, you can download my demo code if you want to follow along in the presentation. There's just a couple of minor, minor tweaks I made to my code. Uh, I had somebody, uh, an attendee in my last session, recommend, recommend that because the code's not always so easy to see on the projector. Anyway, uh, so I've been working with SQL Server 6.5 6, 6 in the mid-90s. And I guess they originally designed that product from Sybase. And it was back in the crazy days when, when you could actually stick uh, multiple databases in the same device, which meant you could take databases that had nothing to do with one another and stick them in the same physical file which, yeah, was insanity, not a good idea. So uh, the product's gotten a lot better since then. I, uh, did, I've done certifications since 6.5. I did like the MCDBA on 7.0-2000 and the MCITP on 2005. Can't remember if I did the 2008. I do more PowerShell nowadays, so uh, I kind of figured that uh, I, I'm not worried about SQL <coughs> Server certifications. But I am the DBA for the company that I work for. I'm also the exchange guy, the AD guy, the sand guy, the firewall guy, you name it. I'm the only engineer. But today we're going to be building some unconventional SQL Server tools in PowerShell. And you'll see what I mean by that. I've, uh, we'll go through this slide. But I do have one question for the audience first. Who was in my session on Monday? Okay, I'll try not to repeat myself too much if it's really important to the attendees that weren't there. I'll repeat myself, but uh, if you didn't see that session, I'd definitely recommend taking a, a look at it, even if you're not working with DSC, it was DSC related. But there's some good tips in there if you're just building any kind of uh, PowerShell tools. So my name is Mike F. Robbins. I'm a Microsoft MVP on Windows PowerShell, Safety and Technologies MVP leader and co-founder of the Mississippi PowerShell user group, co-author of the Power, Windows PowerShell TFM 4th edition. I read a chapter in the PowerShell Deep Dives book. I uh, was winner of the advanced category in the 2013 scripting games. And if you want to learn more about me, just see my blog site. Okay, I've got some questions for the audience. How many IT pros do we have in the room? Okay, good. How many developers? And you may be both. Okay, what about DBAs? <clears throat> you may be like me, you're the uh, reluctant DBA. <laughs> okay, and uh, who's, who's working with SQL Server today? Okay, good, I'm, I'm glad I, the session's gonna start out where it's not too advanced, but by the end of the session, it's gonna be, it's gonna be deep. Because uh, I didn't wanna start out by talking in, over anybody's head. Okay, so who's writing uh, Transact SQL today? Okay. And who's working with the .NET framework? Okay. And who's using some type of source control system for their PowerShell code? Okay. And who's uh, using uh, some sort of unit testing system such as Pester? Okay, and uh, the source control and, and unit testing, that's something you, you uh, definitely want to learn more about. And who's using the uh, PS Script Analyzer? Okay, that's something that uh, you can use to test your code with for best practices. And if you find that your, your code is just horrible based on the PS Script Analyzer, there's actually uh, some reading material I've got for you on the resources slide. Because what you want to try to do is write your code so that you don't have a lot of problems with it. And it's really a thought process, and that's what, what, what my sessions this week have been about, is 
I'm not going to give you a fish or a, a toolkit, but you're welcome to buy a toolkit because they're on GitHub if you want to start with it. Just fork the repository and uh, do take pull request. But I want to teach you to fish. I want to teach you how to write your own toolkit. I want to teach you the mindset. So the information we're going to be covering <coughs> is we'll talk about the uh, SQL PowerShell module and snap in. We'll talk about the SQL PowerShell provider, we'll talk about SQL management objects, the .NET framework, uh, transact SQL versus using commandlets, functions, modules, tool making, automation, and we're going to use PowerShell to write some dynamic T-SQL code because why not use the tool instead of doing things manually, even writing your code manually? Write PowerShell code. I've actually used PowerShell code to write PowerShell code for me. And I've got a good blog article on doing that with DSC configurations. And I, I presented for the Omaha PowerShell user group. That, that session is recorded and I demonstrated that as well. So how do I get the SQL PowerShell module? So this is from tw SQL 2014. It's installed as part of the management tools. Now on some previous versions, I was actually, actually able to install just the SDK and get it that way. But I found in 2014, I actually do need the basic management tools to get the PowerShell functionality. Now that's going to change. Uh, on on a Friday, they actually released the uh, a preview version of SQL Management Studio. So it looks like what they're starting to do is break out the SQL Management Studio <coughs> from the like install disk. And uh, the good thing about this pre this is a preview build for March. The good thing about this, there's several things in the PowerShell SQL module that are fixed. It no longer changes your current location. It, uh, it no longer uses unapproved verbs. It also uh, it loads much faster. And I'm going to show you the code they're using today, why it loads so slow. And the more modules you have on your machine with uh, SQL 2014 or prior, the slower it loads because of the way they wrote their PowerShell commands. So that means it's time for the demo. We'll come back for a few more slides toward the end of the session. Okay, I want to show you the environment we're uh, working with here. So this machine's running Windows 10, Enterprise Edition. We've got Hyper-V. We've got a domain controller running, and if all these are running uh, Windows Server 2012 R2, Server 4, so we have a domain controller. We have a, a SQL 2014 box, a SQL 2008 R2. And by the way, they say you can't run 2008 R2 on server four. It's not supported. So don't try this at home, but it is running on server four. Uh, and then this SQL 03 box is a Windows 2008 non R2 with no PowerShell, and it has SQL 2005 with no PowerShell. Uh, when I go to SQL Saturday events, I hear from a lot of DBAs that, hey, I can't write one PowerShell command to query all these different versions of SQL and Windows and so on. Yeah, you can. You just have to write it for the lowest common denominator. It's kind of like if you still have PowerShell 2, 3, and 4 in your environment, you can write one command and use it on all those machines. But unfortunately, you got to write it using V2 syntax. So just to prove to you uh, SQL 03, I've tried to run PowerShell. Hey, it doesn't exist. If I look at the, uh, the Windows features, no PowerShell. And the reason I chose this version, it's going to be out of uh, SQL 2005, I think it's going out of support here in a, a week or so. Uh, but I wanted to get the newest version of Windows Server and SQL that didn't uh, require PowerShell. And actually what I'm going to show you will work on even older versions. So we'll switch back and forth between a couple of virtual machines. I've done a little prep for this demo. I've uh, made the text size 130, changed into the demo folder. I've set my uh, error messages to yellow because the red ones are kind of hard to read on the projector. So we're going to query the servers and actually the machine that I'm on just to make sure we've got connectivity and also to show you the PowerShell version. So we've got version 4 on uh, one of the servers version 5 on the others, and uh, the one that doesn't have PowerShell is going to fail. And 
And I've got detailed notes in here as well. So we'll get into the intro part of this. I'm just going to enter a one-to-one -one remoting session on SQL 02 since it's a SQL Server 2008 R2. I want to show you the few commandlets. I want to show you where we were and where we are as far as how many commandlets the SQL team has added. <coughs> and actually only two of these, three of these are part of the, uh, so we've got two here. We've got two that are part of the SQL uh, com commandlets and the other ones are part of the SQL Server provider. So in SQL 2008 R2, you really, you've got five commandlets total. That's it. That's all you get. And I don't know about you, I've still got SQL 2008 boxes running in production today. And I would imagine that a lot of people do. Okay, so we'll just exit out of that remoting session. Something else I want to show you is I've installed the SQL 2014 client tools on this, on this PC. I want to show you that what it does, it, it, it actually modifies the, uh, the, the uh, PS module path. <laughs> so there's some DLLs and other things that uh, have to be installed to make SQL management objects work. Well, with SQL 2014, when you import the SQL PS module, all that happens magically. It imports the DLLs and everything. Now, if you have SQL 2008 R2 and you want to use SQL management objects, you have to actually manually import the DLLs. And there's plenty of documentation on the web for that, so uh, if you want to know the details of that, just uh, do a Google or a Bing search on it. Okay, I'm going to import the SQL PS module. It's going to take a couple minutes. Do we have any questions at this point? I'm actually going to mess up our cameraman. I'm going to walk off the stage here. Uh, but this is what I like about PowerShell is that SQL gives me that little four square box to operate in and a lot of other products do. And if I did something like called Microsoft and said, hey, I did the registry on my server, they'd, sorry, that's not supported. But with PowerShell, I could probably call them and say, yeah, I modified the registry at PowerShell. Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> so I don't have to operate inside the box that people give me to operate in. <clears throat> so you'll notice we do have the, uh, we have two commandlets in here. I could use the verbose parameter to, uh, to see the details of this, but I have an encode and decode SQL name, and I know why this occurred. Because uh, back in the snap-in days, they had those commandlets, and so when the, and the, the, uh, the snap-ins actually don't do the checking for the uh, approved verbs. So when they moved it to a module, they just moved their commandlets, well, then they started getting this warning. So what they've done in the new version I said this was fixed in is they've been doing what I've been telling them all along. They renamed the commandlets and alias the old names to the new ones. So that way it's not a breaking change. Okay, and if you noticed, it actually changed my current location. I was in the demo folder and it changed me to the uh, SQL Server PS uh, drive. I want to show you some of their code. So this is, this is a, one of the things that it runs when you load the SQL PS module. So they do a get module list available, which is going to get every module on your machine and pipes it, pipe it to where object. <laughs> so that's where my comment comes in, that uh, the more modules that you have on your machine, the slower it's going to be to import the SQL module. But that, that is also fixed in, uh, in the new SQL management installation. And of course, you see that it's signed, so it's not like I can just go hack this file and fix it, you know? <laughs> okay, so let's, let's change back to the uh, demo folder. Let's take a look at all the commandlets we get with SQL 2014. We get lots of commandlets. We actually get some analysis services commandlets, and there are lots in the uh, SQL PS module. But when you import the SQL PS module, it imports both of those. So I stored it in a variable just because it's not so easy to see how many. So we actually have 57 commandlets. So between 2008 R2 
and 2014, we went from five commandlets to 57. I think that's a huge improvement. Okay, so what we can do, we can actually run transact SQL code directly from PowerShell using the invoke SQL command commandlet that, it, that existed since SQL 2008R2. <coughs> so I actually just queried the uh, list of databases on SQL 01. Pretty simple. Now what I want you to think about is, uh, I'm sure everybody here is, is, it's a beginner concept filtering left. I mean, everybody should know that, that you want to filter as early as possible in the pipeline. So, but when you're working with SQL Server, it may, may not be 100% clear uh, what you're doing. So what I can do is actually query a SQL Server database, and I'm actually going to do a select star from the person table. I'm going to bring it back to PowerShell and filter it down to the people with the last name of Browning. So I have a list of the users with the last name of Browning. Well, I can actually do that same thing inside my SQL code, which is a lot more efficient. It's kind of like some of the Active Directory commandlets. I mean, I think we all know they leave a lot to be desired sometimes, depending on what you're doing. And depending on the size of your organization and what you're doing, a lot, a lot of times you're better off using ADSI. But if you don't know ADSI, then you've got to use the uh, PowerShell commandlets. So anyway, now I execute this other command, and you'll <coughs> notice it, it, it was instant. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to run the first one again. And then I'll run the second one as well. Well, the first one took 1167 milliseconds. So the second option took 8.1 milliseconds. And this is all running on this machine, so uh, we're not having to take into account network latency and all that sort of stuff. So what's the difference? The command, the uh, second command was 21 times faster than the first one. So what I actually try to do, I try to write all my code in Transact SQL because I want to filter as early as possible. I don't want to bring anything I don't need back to PowerShell. And a lot of my knowledge with SQL Server is actually, when I started working with PowerShell, it just made sense because you don't want to query all these tables and pull every column and every row back only to filter it later. It's the same concept as filtering left with PowerShell. So what I can also do, I can also run store procedures from PowerShell. So that runs fine. <coughs> Where there's kind of a caveat here. Not all store procedures will run in PowerShell and not all T-SQL code will run in PowerShell. There's a store procedure called SPHO2. And it's basically the processes. And you'll notice I got an error message. It says that duplicate columns are not permitted because it's trying to pull back two columns with the same name. And we can't have two objects with the same name. So what I'll do, let's just copy this. So if I put that on my SQL Server, and this is a SQL Server I'm querying, if I execute that, it executes fine. Well, the problem is, You've got a SPID here, and you've got a SPID there. And the reason you've got two SPID columns is they're doing a join. So they're joining on that column, because you have to have the same. It may not necessarily be the same name in SQL Server always, but the problem with this, we can't just go modify system store procedures. It's probably not a good idea to start with. And even if it works well for a while, guess what? When you apply a service pack, your changes are probably going to go bye-bye. Okay, so what's the solution to that if I really want to run SP who 2 I'll just write my own. Okay, so there's something else called SQL management objects. So I can use SQL manage it, management objects, and I want you to remember that SQL 03 that I'm about to query does not have any PowerShell installed on it. So I can create a new object. And then I can use that object. Guess what? I just, I just got the same output as SP who 2 store procedure, with PowerShell from a machine that doesn't have any PowerShell installed. Pretty cool, huh? How do you connect it to that machine? 
I just created a new object. And this actually uses DLLs behind the scene that are on the client, on the machine you're querying from. So using SQL management objects has the dependency of having the SQL management tools installed on the client you're accessing the server from. But it does not have the dependency of having anything like PowerShell installed on the, on the server end. It does require SQL Server, of course. And this is, this is one of the ways you'll see developers actually access uh, SQL Server. And SQL management objects, I'm gonna show you something here in a few minutes, that uh, it's what the PowerShell provider uses. It's also what the commandlets that they, all they're doing is wrapping their 57 commandlets around SMO. I, uh, I recommend using the .NET framework like you're talking about instead of SMO if you can because uh, it eliminates the dependency of having the SQL Management Studio or at least the uh, PowerShell module installed or the DLL specifically. Yeah, so, what are the examples of use cases for instance? Uh, well the use cases would be if I want to deploy something on a thousand machines, I don't want to put the SQL Management stu Studio on all those machines. I just want to run the command. And I've, I've got some examples of that as well. I've actually got a data reader that I created. And if you don't write .NET, then uh, there's actually some really good stuff. Is uh, I don't know that Warren Frame is in here, but uh, I stole a command from his GitHub repository. And you can find it in my repository now. <laughs> but he, and I don't feel bad about stealing it because he stole it as well. But everybody who's changed that code is actually uh, noted in the in the comments. Justin Deering, he's another PowerShell and SQL guy, if you know him, he uh, is noted in there. And I don't mind getting commands off the internet if it's all text-based. <coughs> but if it's a DLL and it's a black box, then hey, that's another story. But even if, uh, you know, if you're not allowed to download commands from the internet and run it, you're allowed to create your own, so you can just go get uh, invoke SQL command two and take a look at what they're doing and write your own version of it. Or if you're allowed to copy and paste, then you can just copy and paste and create your own command. Let's just do the same. Did, uh, did that answer your question? Yeah. And there's, there's really different use cases. Um, I know a lot of DBAs, and they actually prefer SQL management objects. They prefer to work with those because they're not developers, and they really don't feel comfortable working with the .NET framework. So that would be one reason is sometimes uh, like me, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a developer either, but I was able to figure out how to write a data reader. And then I found the SQL command, uh, invoke SQL command two, and I was like, hey, you know, I'm kind of wasting my time. I'll use this one because it's much more efficient and well written than what I had written. We'll run the same command just to show you that the same command would work on a uh, 2014 server. And we're kind of cover, covering these rapidly. I just want to show you some of the options that we have, and then we'll get into a few more advanced things. OK, so one thing I want you to notice here is we now have a SQL PS provider. It's right here at the very bottom. So that's part of uh, the SQL management, or the SQL uh, <coughs> PowerShell module. And it also shows up as a, uh, a PS drive. So you can use that, that PS drive, and you can actually, uh, I've got a list of my databases and what recovery model they're in and so on, and that was, that was fairly easy. But I don't know about you guys, but I actually hate, uh, I hate using the providers because they're not very well documented. And if you're trying to use tab completion, especially in a SQL provider, a lot of times it'll hang. So. Uh, it's not one of my favorite ways to query SQL Server. And I'll show you that it really doesn't matter. So we still have our SQL object that we created. So we can, we can use it, and you'll notice that both these commands, the output is basically the same from the SQL provider or from SMO. And there's a good reason for that. So if you see what type of object we created here, 
we created an SMO database object. And that was what the SQL uh, management object option. Well, I'm going to show you what type of object the uh, PS provider creates. So it creates the same type of object. So all they're doing with the SQL PowerShell provider is wrapping it around SMO <coughs> so that you don't have to uh, be a developer if you don't want to. And you may ask, why don't, why don't these uh, commands look the same, the output of these commands? One's got more databases than the other. They're doing some filtering with the uh, SQL PS provider. So if I use the force parameter and run the same command, I'll actually get all the databases. So with the SQL PS provider, they hide the system databases unless you use the force parameter. Okay, I just have a quick example of a, I can also run get database, which is one of the newer commandlets. Guess what? Same information. You know what type of, ob I bet you could guess what type of objects it's going to create. <laughs> guess what? SQL management object. So, uh, all those commands, the PS provider and the commandlets, all they're doing is wrapping, uh, wrapping around SQL SMO. Okay, I think I've already imported these uh, modules, but uh, yeah, I've imported those already. This is actually what you used to have to do to import the, uh, <coughs> the SQL PS module and keep it from complaining about the, uh, the names that you would do, disable name checking. One question I hear from DBAs is, why do this in PowerShell? Why just not do it in SQL? What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is I can't use the output in some other system. So since I'm the AD guy and the, and the SQL guy and the Exchange guy and so on, if I did this in SQL, then I couldn't use the output directly anyway in another <coughs> system. So what I can do, I can actually run a command. I've done a bunch of joins here, and I've even done a little bit of text parsing with PowerShell. Don't be afraid to do text parsing with PowerShell. If you can write a command more efficiently using text parsing than using objects, don't be afraid to use it. I've seen people, they'll want the manager in AD, and they'll actually query the user and then do another query on AD to get the manager. Well, you have the manager. You have the DN for it, and you can actually parse the manager out of that, out of that DN, the distinguished name, without having to do a second query to AD. So anyway, I'll query these. And guess what? I just, all those joins and all, I've, just imagine this is the HR database. I've got the person's name, I've got their SAM account name, their U UPN, all this is in SQL, not in AD. Well, guess what I can do with that? Create AD users. So let's query this OU in Active Directory. And I'll show it to you as well while that's waiting. It's the adventure work, so you. I'll do a refresh. There's nothing in there. And we'll give this a second. Shouldn't take that long, but uh, do we have any, any uh, questions at this point? Okay, well, we got an error message. <coughs> so let's do this. Let's just do a get AD user. We'll do a get AD computer. We'll make sure I can talk to AD. And we'll say SQL 01. Okay, so we're talking to AD. Let's run that command one more time. I don't see anything wrong with it. You know, that's the definition of insanity is to do the same thing and expect the uh, different results. But my definition of insanity is to do the same thing more than one time and get different results, which I just got. <laughs> if you're not insane, it will drive you insane. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do, we're actually going to encapsulate this inside measure command. 
We're going to run the same query again. We're going to pipe it to new AD user. And we're going to see how long this takes. And I've, I've shown this at some SQL Saturdays, and I always challenge everybody, who can type faster accurately than I can run this command? And nobody's taken me up on the challenge yet. So I run that command. Shouldn't take too long unless we have a timeout. So it took, I can see there at the bottom, it took 3.1 seconds. Well, guess what? 290 Active Directory accounts. We put their name in there. We put their telephone number. We put their address. We put their uh, job title. Now, who's got temps at your company that can do that and do that accurately in 3.1 seconds? So just go ahead and fire your temps. That's the benefit of doing this in PowerShell, is you're not tied to one system or one technology. So now if I query the, uh, the OU, I can see there's 290 Active Directory user accounts. OK, let's talk about the .NET framework. I actually wrote a SQL data reader using the .NET framework. It's a, it's a function. It's got all the stuff you should have. It's got comment-based help to tell you how to use it. It's got a parameter validation. It's got a begin block that sets up the connection one time. It's got a process block that will iterate through all the commands on the same connection. And then it's actually got an end block that will close the command when it's done. Instead of building a command for every uh, query that you're going to run. So it's a little more efficient to do it that way. So I can actually use that command to query a database. So what I did, I actually got backup information from my uh, MSDB database with that command. At this point, I'm going to jump over to another VM. I've got a Windows 8.1 VM here. And I want to show you there's no, the SQL tools are not installed on this machine. The only SQL tools on this machine are MySQL tools. And I don't mean MySQL, I mean Mr. SQL. So I can take and run this uh, data reader using the .NET framework with, and receive the same results without needing, without having any dependencies whatsoever. So that's the benefit of using the .NET framework. What I can do is, and this here, I actually have a command that we ran earlier. So I'm actually going to create a very simple function to get a list of the databases. And remember, SQL 03 doesn't have PowerShell. So from a machine that, that doesn't have the SMO DLLs on it, I can use the .NET framework and query a machine that, uh, that doesn't have PowerShell on it. So I haven't found a reason. If you're able to write your own uh, SQL commandlets in the .NET framework or use somebody else's, I haven't found a reason not to use the .NET framework. Generally, it's because it's much simpler just to, to use SMO because it's there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. That would be the downfall of the .NET framework. But when you can steal somebody else's code on the internet, then you don't really have that downfall. <coughs> okay. So this is the code we ran. And I, I put it in this file as well, because this is the only file that's on uh, GitHub. So now we're back to uh, notice. Now I'm going to use invoke SQL command 2 which is the, uh, the file I was telling, telling you about. I'll get the same results. But it's not a data reader. You can use it in place of where you've used invoke SQL command. You can actually update and delete and everything. OK, so let's do something that's a little more exciting. Let's search the transaction logs for, I'm sure that you, at your company, that something came up missing in a database. And you say, who deleted that? 
and everybody, all you hear is crickets. Well, somebody deleted something or some process deleted something. And that's one of the reasons you want to make sure you're using service accounts for everything. Because guess what? If you use your account and you set up some process and something comes up missing and, and you're actually innocent, you're, at, you're going to be guilty based on the auditing. So this is actually the command I wrote. It's got all the same things I write in every command I ever use. It actually iterates through all the transaction log backups and the active transaction log. And I'm going to show you here real quick. This is some dynamic SQL that I'm writing. And I'm writing it based on PowerShell. So what happens is when you query the transaction logs, you can break the transaction log up across 64 files. Well, guess what? When you want to query it, there's a position for all 64 files. And if there's only one file, you have to have the one file listed you have to have default listed 63 times. And if you have five files, then you've got to have default listed the number of times that it's necessary. But you can dynamically generate that SQL based on information on another table in SQL Server. So you'll, you'll generate your transact SQL code that somebody would normally have to write manually. I want to show you a simple example. Then we're going to see what code this generates in addition to uh, to the delete operation that occurred. So let's find out what happened to our database. So you can see there that a delete operation occurred on 328 at 319 p.m. And it also gives us the log se sequence number we need to do the restore with to restore it just before the delete operation occurred. We had a report, the reason we knew this, we had a report from somebody that a specific record in the database was missing. And you'll notice, sure enough, when we try to query that record, it's not in the database. So writing dynamic SQL code. So I have a, plain, a function here, a static function. It's code that I showed earlier. It's very simple. So I'll get all the users with the last name of Browning. If I wanted to make, and this will show you in a very simple way what I'm doing. So uh, all I've done is, pr we do this in PowerShell all the time. All I've done is parameterize the function, but I'm using the, the variable inside my SQL query because it's going to get translated before it's sent to the SQL server. So if I want the last name of Browning, I can get that. But if I want the last name of Smith, I can get that as well. So that's the, that's the idea. And this other, the other example is very complicated and kind of convoluted. So uh, I want to make sure you knew what I was doing. So what we're going to do, I actually tweak this code. And this tweak doesn't exist on GitHub. There's a tweak in here that's. Uh, <clears throat> it's actually going to do write verbose and it's going to output the query itself in the verbose output. Make sure I get a clean output window. So what we can do, we can actually take this query here. Yeah, write that manually. Guess what? I can take this. It's not formatted very well, but it's not formatted that bad when it, it works. Just want to get it to a point where you can see all these defaults because it'll run like this. So that's, what, that's the code we generated. So when I execute that, guess what? Same information. And then I'll show you an example. There's no deletes in this one, but it'll still generate the code.
This one's a little bit messier because I've actually got four or five, I think five backup log files. Thank you. That tells me somebody's paying attention. <laughs> See, normally when I go to SQL Center days, I have stuff to give away, and if I had stuff to give away, you would, uh, you would get something. I just don't want this to be formatted so bad. I want to be able to see any problems I have. So that looks good. So you'll notice I've got more transaction log files and we actually have one more problem here. So when I execute that, it should execute without error, without returning records, and it does. So it dynamically creates this information. So if you spread your transaction log backups across 64 files for some insane reason, it'll work. Okay, now for something really cool. We've only got a few more minutes. Okay, so what this is doing, it's getting me the chain of backups. And what I would do is never trust the information that SQL Server gives you. You'll say, sure, your boss will say, do you have backups of the database? Sure. It says so right there. Guess what? That's pulling it out of the database. Something else could have cleaned up those files and deleted them. Just because it says you have a backup doesn't mean you have a backup. <laughs> so that's what we have test path for. So now we're going to restore the database. We're going to restore it in an alternate database. Because, you know, uh, March 28th, that's been a while, so we would lose all our records since then if we restored over the top of it. So I actually have a, a command here called uh, Mr. SQL DB restore file list, it gets the logical and physical file names so that you can uh, do a move on those to a different database name when you're performing a restore. That's the other thing you want to do when you're writing your commands, is have it so you can pipe your commands together so that the uh, output of one can be used <coughs> for the input of another. So we're going to generate an error here. I wrote a blog article about this last week. Guess what, the, uh, the log sequence number that we get from the transaction logs, you can't use it to restore because it gives you a three-part hexadecimal number that's separated by colons. You have to split that, you have to convert that to numeric, and the first part, you just put the two numbers in there, the second part has to be 10 digits, so you pad it with zeros, and the third part has to be five digits, so you have to pad it with zeros. And then when you're done, you have to join it all back together, and then you have the number you can do a restore with. <laughs> so guess what? I wrote a tool to do that, I wrote a blog article about it, and now I can delete that from my memory. <laughs> so that's this convert Mr. Log Sequence number, so that's the converted number. You can also pipe the, uh, when you're searching for a delete, you can pipe it directly to the command. So now we're going to do a restore and we're going to stop it at LSN, the log sequence number. Now if we do a find Mr. Database change, it doesn't find anything, but this is no longer a valid command. Because this command searches the transaction log backups. I just created a new database. The new database doesn't have any transaction log backups. So the real way to find out if it worked is to query the, uh, for the information that was deleted. And there it is. So, as I told you the other day, every time I uh, write a command, I write another command to undo everything. So, that's cleaning up my demo. We'll ju jump back to the slide deck. I'm not a PowerPoint expert, but I have learned one thing. Shift F5 to resume <laughs> where you are. So, I'd like to thank everybody from the PowerShell team that's been around for the last 10 years. We wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for those guys. We'd still be the click next admin. 
This is a resource slide. There's some free stuff. Uh, PowerShell.org, the uh, PowerShell virtual chapter of SQL Pass. They do like lunchtime meetings. They had one today, matter of fact. Uh, SQL Saturday technology events. I'm speaking at SQL Saturday Atlanta on, on May 21st on tool making. And I'm speaking at SQL Saturday Pensacola the first weekend in June on desired state configuration. And I spoke at tons of SQL Saturdays. I speak in Baton Rouge every year. I spoke in at Birmingham, Alabama, Mobile, Alabama. I've spoken at Atlanta before, and, and so on. And I, I speak at some SharePoint Saturdays as well. I spoke last year at SharePoint Saturday in Nashville. Uh, the uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy. Now, Sapien Technologies, the re reason I have them under the free section is they have some really good blog articles that Gene Blender's writing. And also their forums. They actually have some decent forums, and it's not just related to their products. They have some of them just writing PowerShell code, because uh, as a Sapien Technologies MVP, I've been answering some of those questions. PowerShell Magazine, I've written numerous articles there. User groups, I run the Mississippi PowerShell user group, as I mentioned earlier. That's a virtual user group if you don't have a local user group. And we record our meetings as well on our YouTube channel. You can, an alias for that uh, user group website is mspowershell.com. Twitter is another resource, GitHub, blogs. If you want to find a list of good blogs, go to my blog site and see my blog role. If the people that I have in my blog role are not writing good code, or not consistently blogging, then, then they get deleted off the list and uh, somebody else gets added. Uh, there's a PowerShell best practices and style guide, and this slide deck is also on GitHub under my presentations repository. All these are linked to these sites, but uh, that's the reading material I referenced at the beginning if uh, your code is not passing script analyzer. Okay, there's a couple of pre product. I was actually the uh, technical author for this pro PowerShell for database developers. It's a, it's a good book, and then also Pluralsight. We've got one more slide. So that's my contact info. There's the, uh, the book I co-authored and also the one I wrote a chapter in. I'm a big believer in personal branding, so you'll find me at Mike F. Robbins pretty much anywhere. Sign up for services even if I don't use them. Uh, if you want my email address, I have a challenge for you. Go out to my blog site, see the about page. My email address, my real email address is encoded. So decode it and send me an email. <laughs> and then uh, there's the user group. Thank you guys for attending. your code in yeah, the, sure. the one they use for presentation today? Yeah, it's on uh, GitHub. Is it? Okay, great. Take a look. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent presentation. Yeah, all the... Really, uh, really, all the soup to nuts, basically. Yeah, and, and that's what I was trying to do is uh, not start out over people's heads, start out pretty basic, and then get pretty deep. You know. Yeah, that's great. A question? Noel, I just wanted to plug I'll some stuff couple, that I've got a couple of cards for you guys. Hey, thanks. And this is mainly, you've got my information, but it's mainly, I'm not selling anything. This to get you to my blog site. Uh, that's the good thing about my employer. I work for an employer that pays me to write code that uh, I get to give away for free. Mm -hmm. let, me, uh, let me get out Ed's way here. <laughs> What's up? Hey. Oh. You finally get to share the stage with me. <laughs> you had a good crowd, Mike. Woohoo, that's why I'm here. Do you need a ride to the airport tonight? No, I do no. not. Okay. My name, Mike, is this a cool? Did you get one, Mike? No, I didn't. I'd love to have one. How you doing?
you doing? Good. How Good are you? to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, it's going to be awesome. Great, thanks. Thank you. I've got another sticker too. So you didn't bring in Teresa? Uh, no. Uh, She's, oh, she is here. Uh, she's back at like the uh, the courtyard, Marriott. No, she's not here. No, there's kind of like an insurance issue thing, you know. They're coming outside. Thank you. The, the, there's there's kind of like an insurance issue thing, you know, like the thing's sold out. You know, well, that's and, what she was saying. Yeah. If you had too many phones. Yeah. Right? When we talked uh, on Monday, I guess. Yeah. So. Okay. You all right? Yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> Get some coffee. Yeah. I brought you a present too. Oh, cool. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So that is uh, one of those for our own internal scripting games. Yeah, that is uh, that is we really created cool. that. I love our, that. Is our hey, you participate. That's what you get right there. Yeah, that is really cool. I love that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I drug one for for you and Don. Like I said, I was looking for you the other day. I couldn't find you. So scuba diving hat. Yep. <laughs> Leave for that tomorrow. Huh? Leave for that tomorrow. Where are you going? Oh, nothing exciting this time. Just lake diving in uh, North Texas. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it's still breathing underwater, so. It's hard to. I, it'd be hard for me to say what my favorite dive was. Cozumel. Uh, Cozumel, the drift diving there is awesome. I love. I love the drift diving. That's really good. Um, Little Cayman was really good. They got the uh, there was lots of Nassau groupers and stuff there. You know, things that you don't see quite as often. Uh, I love di diving. There was a crater uh, in um, I think Kauai that we went and dove in. I haven't been there yet. And they got this awesome wall dive in that crater. Yeah, you know, and the water is so clear. If you're not checking your gauge. I mean, you, you you'll, you'll wind up 135 feet like that. Blue hole in Belize, have you been yeah. there? I have not done the Doug Belize. So blue hole there yeah. is, is one of those because the bottom is, you know, you, you can't, the, yeah. And you've got the attention. Is it going? And particularly if you dive in nitrox. Well, that's pretty much the only way to dive. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, uh, Aruba was a cool oh, was a cool place. The water there is so warm. Uh, some great dive dives there. So. I haven't been to Aruba either, so. Um, I'm, I'm trying to organize a trip to uh, Australia next year and do the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you what, you know, um, the Great Barrier Reef gets all of the uh, headlines and all the press, you know, but actually you, there's better diving in Sydney, you know, oh, yeah. uh, around the harbor, um, and uh, you, you have, you'll have better visibility most of the time. Well, I'm planning on doing it today. Day yeah. Starts in Sydney mm -hmm. and then goes out. Yeah, because yeah, uh, because dive. Uh, there's a lot of really, really, really good dives around, uh, even around Sydney Harbor, which is basically right outside of the harbor. Really. Um, there's uh, my favorite dive. There is actually it's called the Apartments, which is a series of like underground columns and stuff. It's just so amazing. You know, this semester they have little bitty cuttlefish and stuff there. They have weedy dragons and leafy dragons. You know, which are about like this. Yeah, yeah. You know, and those dudes are so cool. They have like little bitty fins on their shoulders, and they kind of move around like helicopters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you go south of Sydney, down around uh, Bateman's Bay, uh, there's some really good uh, diving there. You'll see lots of seals. Um, you know, some some dolphins. You know, lots and lots and lots of sharks. Yeah. You know, um, I, uh, and they have the they have this shark down there. It's called uh, Port Jackson shark or a um, or a wallaby shark, um, and this is like the most mellow shark. So in that movie um, Shark Tales, this is the shark that gets picked on because he's not mean. Got it. Yeah, and um, I like just kind of like mellowing out and stuff, you know. And uh, I was like following one, you know, taking pictures and all of this, and then all of a sudden, came around this corner. And they were there were hundreds of them stacked up like firewood. I was like, yeah. 
coral formation and just a spot where the coral it just dropped down pretty yeah. in the middle about ten foot down. And then we couldn't even see the bottom of the pile. Sure. There were at least I, I twenty of them in there just piled up. I don't want to interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Just need that release if you don't mind. <coughs> But yeah, so, so the cool thing now is that, you know, uh, use, using OMS and, and our OMS like, phone app, you know, you can just put your, uh, put your phone app in a, um, in a sealed case, take it with you on your dive, and you can manage your network, you know, from 150 feet. <laughs> have, have, have you tried that? Did the signal actually work in the app at all? I haven't tried it. <laughs> uh, maybe you need to, like, put a piece of aluminum foil on the back of your phone, you know, to make a better antenna. <laughs> An assortment of connectors. This is the guy. Now, see, I have done that. That's oh, sweet, yeah. That's at 60 feet with McCool. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's pretty clear. Where was that? That's in Jamaica. Oh, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, Car Caribbean is really cool. I mean, the water is usually very, very clear and, and all that stuff. Yeah, I did that uh, two years ago is when I took that picture, and that was right before I left. I put on my blog, and I told people, I said, hey, I'm about to combine PowerShell and Scuba mm -hmm. Dive. I just wanted to let y'all know I'll send pictures. <laughs> <laughs> There's, um, in Mexico, um, the Sea of Cortez is an awesome place to go diving. Okay, I haven't been there. Uh, Me Mexico, I mean, you can, uh, you you can, you can catch, uh, catch a little flight um, out of... Um, you know, out of uh, Phoenix, you know, to get you down there. There's some pretty cool places right along there. You know, a lot of little dive shops and stuff. Yeah, yeah but, uh, Mexico, uh, I exclusively went to do the Yeah, case. but yeah, Sea Cortez is really nice. Yeah, um, you'll see all kinds of different sea life. Lots of sea lions and stuff. If you, uh, really? Sea lions are cool. Seals are cool. Where in Mexico is that? Um, I'm trying to, uh, trying to think of the town that we flew into. I can't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, the Sea of Cortez runs along Baja and all this stuff, you know, and everything. It's really oh. long. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I can't remember the name of that little town we went into. It was like not much there. Yeah, I mean, I've never been to the west side at all. A little dive shop and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Two minutes. Do you need your mouse or hmm? do you need your mouse? Oh, yeah, yeah, mouse. <laughs> mouse, mouse, mouse. Somebody had made a mouse that uses the mini USB connector. <laughs> I know.
think we're good. We're all set. Okay, uh, it's uh, two o'clock, so uh, it's about time for us to go ahead and get started. Push the button. Push the button. Is there a button to press? A red button. Are you recording? A red button. Do you see a red button? Oh, this red button. Did that work? Is there a blue light flashing? No. 